one of the things that really stands out and that I know right out of the gate, the listeners of this show should resonate with. I've heard you in other interviews use this analogy of a totem pole. If you're not the absolute top of that totem pole, you need to rethink what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get to the top of the totem pole. You know, I'm married with children. I have multiple businesses. I put myself before all of that, my wife, my kids, because I know if I am well, I show up to the world well. So I don't sacrifice time with my wife and my children and my businesses so that I can like sit in the sauna and, you know, cold plunge and work out. <laughs> I don't do that. I wake up at 445 every morning, two hours before everybody else in my family does so that I can have a really nice, slow paced, self love, self indulgent, self care morning practice that by 630 in the morning, I'm like fucking Iron Man. Let's link up with Krista on The Fix. She's a wellness coach with a focus on mental well-being and physical strength. Hey, hey, Fix listeners, welcome back to our latest episode of The Fix Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Huber, and you have a treat for today's podcast interview. I was joined by Michael Chernow, who has a very incredible life story, an amazing experience and, and list of restaurants that he's opened in New York City. And for those of you who are local, you probably know many of them. And he drops a few of the names throughout the conversation. The Meatball Shop, Seymour's are two of the big ones. But the conversation had very little to do with that and more to do with habits and his latest venture called Creatures of Habit. And I'm not going to steal his thunder. And I want you to buckle up for this conversation and take notes because it is just loaded with those really amazing golden nuggets about your lifestyle that are authentic, genuine, and achievable. Michael walks us through his morning routine that he warns you and I will warn you, has many, many steps to it. But what was so cool about it for me and the biggest takeaway that I got from this conversation is that he is so self-aware and adaptable and knows that you don't have to to wake up every morning and convince yourself that you are, he said this in the episode, kind of towards, I would say the back half of it, but telling yourself all these positive things over and over again, there's a lot of power in that, but it's also important to give yourself grace. And it's also important to talk to yourself in a way that you acknowledge the stories that you might be telling yourself, the, the fear that you're uncomfortable with addressing and and he talked about fear in the sense that it is a really great equalizer because everyone has it. So whether you are day two into a fitness and nutrition journey or you're day one million and you've lost track of how many days it's been, you're years into your fitness routine, you've got your nutrition dialed in, there's something in this episode for you no matter where you're at. And would love feedback on this one because I'm curious to hear what parts kind of hit for different listeners out there. So if any of it resonated with you, please reach out to me. Shoot me a DM at the Krista Huber or over at the fix.official pod. And if this entire concept of habits really, really speaks to you, first and foremost, go check out Creatures of Habit. Get your hands on some of their oatmeal. We just might have a little hookup for the fix listeners out there very soon. So stay tuned on that. And more importantly, Ask yourself how you can start with one small thing today. If you really want to commit to change, just pick one thing. Michael shares many throughout the course of this episode that you might be able to use for inspiration, but it's totally cool to start small. And I love sitting down with people who have had amazing journeys and have really grown and are continually committed to their growth as well. And I think that'll really shine through throughout this entire episode. So enjoy this one. And welcome to our latest episode of The Fix Podcast.
Michael, welcome to The Fix Podcast. So happy to have you today. And I know that you made this cup of coffee special for this interview. So we're gonna kick things off and start right with that. What do you like to sip on in the morning or it is actually the afternoon when we're recording this. So what's your go-to coffee of choice? Tell me about it. So my go-to coffee, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. Super fired up to be here. Um, My go-to coffee in the morning is... I do a pour over coffee nice. every single morning. I like, I feel like the flavor profile is just richer with pour over. It takes a while, but I, I really enjoy that. And then I have, I, I love this, this coffee enhancer from a company called mine, right? It's like this nootropic, really tasty powder that I just put into my coffee every morning and I blend it and it's just delicious. And so that's typically my morning sip on drink. Awesome. Well, we're definitely going to unpack the point about your pour over and that being a part of your morning routine and the time it takes. So I'm going to come back to that. But before we do, the big question that I did give you the heads up on and kind of the question that will really guide the rest of this conversation and invite the fix listeners into understanding why you're here today and what you have to share with us and the knowledge that you have to share through your brand and just through your own personal story. I would love to know beyond creatures of habit, beyond your resume, you know, who are you to your core, but more specifically, why should we care about what you have to share in the rest of this conversation? You know, when I was walking over to make my cup of coffee, I was trying to think about what I wanted to say here. The truth is I am an average human being. And for years, I was a sub average human being. And I made a decision about 18 and a half years ago, to change my life and commit to positive habits. And I've built a life beyond my wildest dreams in my personal life, my business life, and my family life. I never thought that I'd be where I am today. And I'm not like walking around with trophies, but I am saying that I am a normal dude and I've been able to put a lot of shit up on the board. And it's all because I've made a commitment to myself through positive habits. The most powerful thing for me that you said in that is the fact that you made the commitment to yourself. So first, for those who don't know your story, I want to congratulate you for your 18 year going on 20 year, let's call it, cause you're closer to that mark, right? I'm sure of sobriety, that's huge. And I have had the opportunity to listen to several podcasts and I'm really fascinated by the journey that you've been on and how you got to where you are today. But one of the things that really stands out and that I know right out of the gate, the listeners of this show should resonate with, especially the ones who are my clients and understand what we focus on inside of the Fitness Fix coaching program is the priority of putting yourself first. And I've heard you in other interviews use this analogy of a totem pole. And I really like that from a visual perspective. So I'd love, instead of me stealing your thunder, I'd love for you to kind of unpack that a little bit and dive a little bit deeper into maybe that version of you from 18 years ago, 20 years ago, even beyond that, versus the person you are now and where you sit on your totem pole? Sure. The short answer is if you are not at the absolute top of your totem pole, you know, like when you think about a totem pole, right? It's just it's like a long tree that's been whittled and, and characters painted on it, right? And there's always, it's always like sort of segmented. There's like five to nine mm-hmm. characters on the totem pole. If you're not the absolute top of that totem pole, you need to rethink what you do on a day-to-day basis in order to get to the top of the totem pole. And, and, and I mean, you know, I'm married with children. I have multiple businesses. Um, I put myself before all of that, my wife, my kids, because I know that if I am well, I show up to the world well. If I don't feel confident in my ability to show up, everyone and everything around me 
suffer in some way, shape or form. So I don't sacrifice time with my wife and my children and my businesses so that I can like sit in the sauna and, you know, cold plunge and work out. <laughs> I don't do that. I wake up at 445 every morning, two hours before everybody else in my family does. And the people that work with me do <laughs> uh, so that I can have a really nice, slow paced, self-love, self-indulgent, self-care morning practice that by 6.30 in the morning, I'm like fucking Iron Man. I love that. I'm like untouchable, you know? And then I turn all that, all the, the, like the rest of my day, I don't, I don't worry about me anymore. It's all my wife, my kids, my business, my friends, my, my extended family, like it's all, it's all for them. And, uh, but I know that I need to be first. I need to be first. And for years and years, that was never how I sort of, uh, saw life. You know, I've got a, everything went before me and a lot of successful people, um, are not happy. Like when we think of the word successful, right? Like, we all are drawn, like you hear, oh, that guy, you know, that, 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 that woman is successful. Mm -hmm. That man is, that person is successful. We're like, oh, what kind of car do they drive? What's, right. What does their mansion look like? That. You know? And really, I have, I believe that success is a balance of, yes, that's a part of it. But man, like, I want to be happy. And I also have, I've, 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 taken my foot off the gas a little bit in, in regards to what I thought was going to make me happy as an entrepreneur. Mm. I was like, build, build, build money, 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 make, make, make revenue, revenue, revenue. Like, and so now I've learned that like, yes, that's, that stuff is very important. I've got investors. I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta make it work. But I also know that I take three vacations a year and the weekend's off now. And I have no guilt and shame about that. And yes, have I put in the hours and the, the the work for to get to that point? I have, but I'm still young, right? Like I, I could continue to work every weekend and pedal to the metal nonstop and maybe I'd have more, but do I need more? Is more gonna make me happier or is more gonna make me more miserable, right? Like I asked myself that question. So the totem pole analogy is basically like, if you're not at the top, you need to rethink it. And if you think that, um, you know, money is going to make your emotional state better all the time, you're wrong. You know, it's very similar and to the idea around weight loss and fat loss too, right? It's the perfect correlation of you get the new client who, yes, they have a goal. And I tell my clients all the time, there's nothing wrong with wanting to lose weight. There's nothing wrong to wanting to have that aesthetic goal. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have their performance goal of, you know, hitting certain PRs in the gym or whatever it is that drives you. The longevity piece is a huge one too, especially with a lot of the women that I work with and where they're at in their lives. They're also the people who when they hear the first half of what you just said, this alarm bell goes off for them. That's like selfishness equals negative instead of that positive story of the way you just described it. And I've totally been that person myself. So I can acknowledge them for what they're saying. And I'm definitely in a season of my life where I resonate with what you're saying of, I need this conversation even for me in that I'm trying to do lots of different things between the podcast and my one-on-one -on -one client business and other gym partnerships I have from a nutrition coaching perspective. And it's a lot. And there's some days where I'm like, okay, you really have to ask yourself, like, is all of this really what you love right now in this moment? And to go back to what I was saying about that analogy, like, it's the same principle of someone saying like, oh, I think, well, once I have this money, I'll feel X, Y, Z way. Once I have this, I will feel like that. So many people in their weight loss journeys struggle with that same thing because they have this relationship to the scale where they're like, well, I don't like the number right now, so I have to go and change it. Yeah, okay, that's, I see you, I hear you, that's all valid. But if you don't like yourself right now 
at the current weight that you are, a different pant size, fitting into a certain outfit, whatever measurable you want to use, most of the time it doesn't fill that gap, especially if you absolutely hate the process with which you choose to get there too. So the, the, the things that I think I'd like to talk about potentially, if you're cool with it, Go is for it. controlling the controllables. Love it. That is a phrase I use all the time. So people should be taking notes. <laughs> controlling the controllables, you know, there's nothing better. And I, I you know, I, I, it's not all about winning, right? Life isn't all about winning, but it feels good to win. Of course. It just does. Yeah. And I think what, what, what helped me transition from the life that I lived before, which was truly a life of addiction. I was addicted to drugs and alcohol for 12 years of my life. And then coming out of that, I was taught that I can win every day. And those wins for me and from the, from the, from the mentors that I had at the time came through fitness and nutrition. And I, you know, it, it was basically like you can and you have fed yourself negativity mm. for years, literally fed however you sure. consumed it. It was it was negative, toxic substance that you were putting into your body, whether it was food, alcohol, drugs, whatever. It was never good. And so you have gotten very, very used to feeding yourself negativity. And if you feed yourself negativity, how do you think it's going to metabolize? Is positivity? It's no. just going to grow. Yeah. It's going to it's going to metabolize as as deeper negativity. And so these these guys that took me under their wing said, "We're going to start feeding you mental, physical, and spiritual positivity, <laughs> and it's going to come with healthy food that you're going to feel good about. And when you feel good about what you put into your body." You win. It's a win. How different do you Feels think good. your life would look right now if you had not had those mentors? Because I, when I hear that and biased from a biased perspective of being a coach, right? The first thing I think is like, what did he point out? The external source of someone else having that positive influence in his life. Yet there's so many people who listen to podcasts like this or consume the content that you create, consume things like creatures of habit, and we'll get into what it is exactly too, because I want you to talk about it more specifically. And they just still won't take the leap for whatever reason. Like they won't, they'll, they'll kind of dip their toe in the water and like convince themselves they're starting to make a couple changes, but it's not until they come clean a little bit and actually raise their hand and say, I need help that the, the catalyst for change can really, really grow. And I think you're evidence of that. Well, I am, I am like walking, living, breathing evidence of that. And really what it all boils down to from my, from my perspective is your threshold for wanting to face fear. Fear is everything. We are, fear is everywhere. Fear can be the most incredible motivator or the most devastating debilitator, right? Fear is why people go on a diet and hop off their diet. Fear is why people go to the gym and stop going to the gym. Fear is why people ask for help and then disappear. It's all fear-based. And so what I, what I have been saying for years is, and, and by the way, to, to me too, everything, everything that I say, honestly, is me talking to myself totally. out loud, yeah. hoping that it, it, it makes, it, it helps me. And, 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 you know, my mission is to hopefully try to help one person every day, right? Like if something I say can fucking help you, I'm stoked. Basically, if you can learn, train yourself, through habit to love the heart and the hurt unstoppable will be your dna you have to for me i i look for it today Give I, us I, I'm, I'm like a i'm like a fear hunter i'm looking for the fear i'm running at it as hard as and fast as i can because i know that on the other side of fear can I curse on this? Is it? Is yeah, it you can go for it. Okay, you sorry. got it. I appreciate <laughs> um, you asking, but, I, but no. But I, I'm ago. a passionate guy. I I know that on the other side of fear is 
freedom. Hands down, mm. that's it. There's one thing on the other side of fear and it's freedom. And what I learned also about fear is that 90% of the fear that we experience is a fabricated story that we make up and tell ourselves. And the more we tell it to ourselves, you know, we're like the greatest pathological liars internally. <laughs> it's so true. The more we tell us those, tell ourselves that story, the more we believe it. It's so much easier to say, there's no way I'm going to make that happen. There's no chance I can do that. It's, it's like impossible. Like, how am I going to get through this? Like, that's such a huge, that would be so hard to do. Like, I'm, I just don't have it in me. It's so much easier to say that than you got this, dude. You fuck, you are awesome. You are going to accomplish this. There's no, there's nothing that can stand in my way. How, how much harder is it to have that conversation with so yourself much. than the I suck conversation? So much harder. So I also, and like, we'll get into my morning routine, but like I said, you know, I, I've dedicated my life to committing to positive habits and slowly but surely I have built this awesome life and have done things that no one would have ever, including myself, even fathomed be possible for me to do. And it's all because of committing to myself. So let's start yeah. with some of, you know, kind of take me back to that tipping point where you got sober, you had those mentors in your life, you got really focused on fitness and nutrition. If I remember correctly, you got really into Muay Thai, right? That was probably mm -hmm. the group that you're referencing. And for someone who may be listening to this and that person who, I, I think this is classic for this time of year as well, it's the time of year when people give up on their New Year's resolutions. And often I see that's because they tried to set so many different habits all at once. So walk us through some of the basics. Like if you could take yourself back to that version of you 19 years ago and you have all this knowledge now and you also have all of this experience and repetition and really getting those reps in in so many different areas, whether that is from being in the gym, your morning routine, any of those things, success in business, failure in business, leaning into fear, right? All of that plays into the perspective that you have now and how you choose to show up today. But I think there's people out there who can listen to that. They can listen to me say similar things. And sometimes they repeat that fabricated story that they're just like, oh, well, you know, Michael and Krista, they're so much further down that, that path. They're more committed to their self-discovery. So how can we make this digestible? How can we, we word this to somebody or explain this to somebody to help them figure out what that first step can be for them? Go to bed at nine o'clock every night. That's it. That's it. That's all you got to do. I like that. Forget about the fitness. Forget about the nutrition. Forget about the waking up at 5 a.m. Forget about the 10,000 steps. Start with going to bed at nine o'clock every night. Commit to that. Because if you go to bed at nine o'clock every night and you get used to going to bed at nine o'clock mm -hmm. at night, right? Eventually, you're going to start waking up at five. It's just going to happen. Right. And if, and if so, if you go to bed at nine and you wake up at five, now you've got, you just earned the most valuable asset in your life, which is time. And quite frankly, from my experience, nothing really life changing, life altering happens after nine o'clock at night. It's so, that's so true. <laughs> you know, it's not like, the like the, the you know you're not like winning you're not like getting the the, the work bonus at nine at, at 10 30 at night at 10 30 at night if you don't unless you work at night but at 10 30 at night you are watching netflix most most of the time scrolling on social media doing probably inefficient work on your computer because you're tired because you probably just worked all day and you're still trying to squeeze in the extras 
not a lot, not a lot of great shit happens after nine, nine 30 at night. So if, if you really want to take a step and do something that's attainable, practice going to bed. I mean, you can even start by just an hour earlier. Sure. And then eventually I'm in bed every night between nine and nine 30. And, um, that is a game changer. It is a game changer. That's a very chewable thing because if I told you, okay, wake up, you know, wake up at 5 a.m., you'd be like, I go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, right? 12 o'clock. And I'd be like, hmm, well, I probably wouldn't want you to get, you know, five, six hours of sleep. I so hate it's to be say hard. it, but I did this exact thing last night. But it's also partially being the person that does try to squeeze in work at night, like you're saying. And then also waking up really early to teach fitness classes too. So it's like, okay, you got to think about, and I totally hear you. Like I've gotten to a point in my career where now I am asking myself, like, does this make sense for Krista, right? Like putting myself at the top of that totem pole for where I really want to go. And more importantly, what actually makes me happy, is it worth it to who I am as a person to be like, yes, I'm totally going to teach that class at 5 a.m. Maybe not. And really start to reassess that, right? Because that is cutting into the opportunity for that time potentially. And I've started to see how it affects how I feel, not even just from being tired, but like my ability to then pour into my clients when I've had that type of day. Because I didn't set myself, like I'm rushing out the door, grabbing my food. I check the boxes, right? I do the things I need to do because I prioritize my fitness and nutrition as much as I can. But there's always that voice in my head that's like, at what point is this not going to serve Krista specifically anymore? I, I, I used to really preach and I still do because I think it's so incredible to have an hour or two every morning to really indulge in like self-love. Um, but when I, when I started to really think about it, it's daunting for people to hear that they sure. go to bed that have like, that just stay up aimlessly, you know? And so what I've really started to think more about is I'm going to talk about going to bed earlier. You it's know? that reverse and engineering, the, the goal, right? Like this is somewhat opposite, but if we want to dive into the sleep example, when it comes to setting circadian rhythm, so many people don't realize that, it starts with consistency and routine, like you're describing of going to bed at nine o'clock or whatever time it is, but it also has a lot to do with how you start your morning. And so many times people are like, oh, well, if I need to work on my sleep, like, should I just go to bed sooner? It's like, no, there's two sides to this here. So if you figure out what your weakest point is, or um, one, I ha I've had a nutrition coach who words it this way, and I think you'll appreciate this. She says, there's the big fucks in your life, and the little fucks that you have. And sleep is the big fuck. It doesn't matter, as you said. It doesn't matter what you're eating. It doesn't matter what your fitness routine looks like because it's so foundational to recovery, your mood, so many different things. But people won't admit what you just said. Like, what are you doing at, at 10 o'clock at night that is truly that productive for yourself? And then they can't figure it out. They're like, oh, my sleep quality is so bad. It's like, all right, were you on your phone? Yes. Could you put your phone on the other side of the room? Could you put it in a different room? Like there's so many things we could throw at this. And I think that's where people then try to just like try to do so many different things at once. So I really appreciate the fact that you said, hey, you want to get up earlier? Well, let's work all the way backwards. I do the same thing with my clients with their nutrition. It's like you want that pizza. You want to have certain things. You want to enjoy going out to dinner without feeling like, oh my God, what should I eat for this meal? One of the toughest questions that I get from clients constantly is, hey, I'm going to this restaurant. What should I order? I always hit them back with a question and they kind of hate that. But I can't give you advice until you tell me what else you ate today. And even better on top of that is if we had had this conversation yesterday, because chances are you knew you were going to this restaurant, then we could have really made a great decision and I could have taught you and you could have had that moment of like, what lens am I looking at this through? to develop the skills that you need that the next time you go to any restaurant at all, you can handle the situation.
You know what I, I what I've loved because I nutrition and fitness have like have become like a very big part of my life. Yeah. And I've taken it to a pretty high level. Sure. Um uh I for up until recently, I was competing as a bodybuilder. Nice. And I was doing men's physique bodybuilding. And um, you know, I was competing in a in a natural bodybuilding organization where like you it's so much harder. Of course. You know, because I'm not I'm not taking any, you know, performance enhancing drugs. So like to get to stage ready, you know, I've got to eat. It's ridiculous how des- disciplined I You're have to very be. Very precise with your macros, I'm sure. But insane. Same same with recovery. I that too. Oh yeah. But that but that yeah, that 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 paved the way for everything for me. But the thing that I'll say is is that the beauty of living a, like a life of wellness is that at a certain point, you don't want to eat pizza and burgers every day. You want to eat a consistent diet and then have absolute freedom on a Friday night mm-hmm. to like not have to call your nutritionist and be like, Hey, what can I eat? You're like, no, no, no. Like I, I killed it this week. Like I, I was, I was on. I was uh, 85% of my life, 90% of my life. I'm like autopilot. I, I, cause I love it because it makes me feel good. Cause like, yeah. there's nothing worse than eating something and hating yourself an hour later. That's like, it's self-sabotage, Hundred percent, you yeah. know? And so for me, I'm like, I, I never want to, I never want to be, be there again. I never want to like do something intentionally and hate myself for doing it an hour later. I want to like fall into a pattern where, and and I and, and this is a marathon. This is like this has taken me years to get to, but I'm speaking from experience. I'm in a place now where Monday through Friday, I'm locked in, and the weekend comes, and I typically eat a. a healthy breakfast most days and a healthy lunch most days. And then I'm just like, dinner time, let's go. Like you want to, you want kids who want pizza. Uh, you want me it. to barbecue. Like we're, we're in it. I'm in it. You know, I just did leg day crushed me. Like, let's go, you know? And, that. and that's, and, and, and so shaming myself for having an, like an awesome indulgent meal is It's not where I want to be. And so if I know that, if I know that that's true, and I know that there is steps that I can take so that I can enjoy that stuff in life without hating myself afterwards, show me the way. Tell me what I got to do, because that's how I want to live my life. I don't want to be the the guy that never has a burger it's, I don't want to be that person. It's so, be, it's not yeah. enjoyable. Like food is social. It's, it's connection. Like, I don't have to say this to you. You could speak more on this subject than me, right? Like food is an experience in and of itself. And I think unfortunately with people just constantly chasing something, but also wanting a quicker fix to get there, because what did you just say? This is a marathon. You didn't wake up even a year. Like this didn't take you a year. It didn't take you two. You've been practicing showing up as this person for you to sit here now and confidently say that. But you've oh. also, you know, you mentioned ch- like looking for opportunities to chase fear. We could make the argument that that is an example of that, like leaning into that type of discomfort to create the discipline, leaning into this, this discomfort of, like you said, bodybuilding, that's on the more extreme end, Right. We don't need everybody listening to this to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go run out and be a bodybuilder to learn a lot of those habits and execute them on a regular basis. You know, I, I want to say something, especially yeah. be, for your, for your audience, because I think it's important to say, um, anybody who's listening to this, who's struggling, whether it's struggling with sticking to a nutrition plan, struggling with staying consistent with their workout programming, struggling with getting 10,000 steps a day, struggling with getting out of bed, struggling with drugs, struggling with alcohol. What I, what I'd like to say is that you are 1 million percent capable of making the right decision. 
You are 1 million percent capable. I'm, I'm not saying this because um, I think it's true. I'm saying it because I was a heroin addict and I overdosed on heroin more than once. Never thought I was ever going to be able to stop doing it. And as soon as I got sober, I developed an eating disorder because I just wanted to consume. I didn't, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. I was just like, these guys told me to eat healthy. So I ate it. I ate it all. You know, I was just like, you know, whether it was broccoli, chicken, whatever, I was just eating, you know, I was just like, and I, and it took me time to understand that I have the ability to make the right decision. You're, you're posed with, with, propositions all day long from the second you open your eyes to the second you go to bed you can go left or you can go right you know which to sit which direction to go most of the time right i like to go right so i think about that often there are times where i will catch myself it'll be and this and i had to build this into my routine when i was bodybuilding right in prep so I'm hungry all the time. I'm working out like an animal. I'm doing like like an obscene amount of cardio. I mean, sure. I put myself through hell. Yeah. And I'm eating like 1,100 calories a day. Totally unhealthy. Do not recommend this to anybody. <laughs> it's a, it, it is not healthy. But I wanted to see how far I can go. It'd be 8 o'clock at night. And I'd say, that's it. Fuck it. I'm gone. I'd get up at, off the couch. I'd walk towards the kitchen. I'd plan it out. I know exactly the drawer that I'm going into. I know exactly what's inside that drawer. I know exactly where my hand's going to grab the handful of whatever it was. And I'd walk my, I'd walk over there and I'd say, Mike, you can go left or you can go right here, brother. You got to make the call. Are you going to go left? Or are you going to go right? Do you want this or do you need this? Do you want this or do you need this? You want this. Turn the fuck around. And it's that simple. And I know it, it, it's not that simple. But when I, but the truth is, is that logistically, it's that simple. It is that simple. Yeah. That's it. You and say. For you now, it's that simple because you have that intrinsic belief, right? That you know how to speak to yourself that way to, you developed that self-awareness. That's why for you, it's easier to sit here and say it is that simple. Like you're willing to have that conversation with you. I think a lot of people aren't willing to have that conversation with themselves. Well, anybody who's listening, who's not willing to have that conversation with themselves, I'm here to tell you that you can, I'm not unique. I'm not a fucking, you know, snowflake falling from the sky. <laughs> that is a one of a kind. I'm, I promise you, 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 there, every single human being on the planet has the ability to do what they say they're going to do. The problem is you are what you do, not mm-hmm. what you say. You know what I'm saying? So like, and this is, this is from my experience. Sometimes I have to say to myself and check myself and be like, dude, are you, are you, do you believe what you say you're going to do? Or do you know that this is who you are because it's your, your actions are dictating this. And sometimes I have to check myself and be like, oh shit, you know what? Like I said, I was going to do that and I didn't do it. You know, and so maybe I should walk through my crazy morning routine. Yeah, because Um, what you just said, I want you to weave that into your morning routine. Because for me, the thing that that's standing out, the very last comment you just made of you checking yourself and having conversations with yourself. I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption that you may do a lot of that self-reflection in the morning, because I think the other thing that's missing for many people is just again, time, but worded differently, the opportunity to make space to even do that. Cause so many mm-hmm. people are just go, go, go. Like you said, you have your t- time in the morning, but then what happens the rest of your day? You're like, go, 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 go. So think about all the people who get out of bed. They didn't make that time. They're rushing immediately. And then it's like, oh, they're not doing it. So talk we to have me control about that. Of, over very little in our lives. Yeah. Once, once another human being steps into, into the periphery, our control is completely diluted. It's, and sometimes gone, you know, like we have control over very little. And so I like to utilize that time in the morning 
to have absolute complete control. And it's not because I'm a control freak. It's because I want to grow. I want to grow and I want to progress. And I know leaning only on other people isn't going to, to get me the greatest results because I don't live in other people's heads. So like having that time in the morning for myself, an hour and a half, two hours is paramount for my happiness. It's paramount, you know? And, and, and again, like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sacrifice time with my family and friends and, and, and business so that I can be the selfish guy that's going to, you know, do all the things that I'm about to tell you I do every morning. But I sacrificed my time. And when I say that, it sounds like a, like a, uh, it, 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 you know, I should rephrase it. It's not a sacrifice. It's, it's, I give myself mm. that time. You know, I, 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 it's a blessing that I'm able to do it. And, and, you know, my wife is my, my best friend. She's very different. She thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> totally. Most so now people we have to think, hear what it is. Well, um, so I just want to preface by saying that this is an extreme routine. Um, and I, and, and for me at this point, it, it flows very smooth and seamlessly. But when I lay it out, it sounds intense. I actually just posted a podcast yesterday that walked saw- through my morning routine. Um, but, but, and it didn't start this way. That is for sure. It's taken me years, almost two decades to develop the routine that I'm going to give you now that really does, I feel invincible when I'm done with it. And that's when the rest of the world wakes up. So I basically get up at somewhere between 4.45 and 5 a.m. Um, I don't sleep with an alarm because I'm in bed by 9.30 latest every single day. And my body likes seven hours of sleep. If I get eight, great. Sometimes eight even makes me feel a little groggy. So like somewhere between 6.45 and seven and a half hours is like okay. my sweet spot. Okay. Um, and I wake up, I sleep with, a, with an eye mask on. First thing I do, as soon as I know I'm awake, is I flip back my eye mask, I look up at the ceiling, and I smile like a shit-eating grin from ear to ear, (laughs) and I hold it there. And it's awkward, even to this day, and I've been doing it for years. It feels weird. But after about 10 seconds of holding that shit-eating grin, like pearly white, unbelievably embarrassing smile, I feel a sense of optimism and positivity. It just washes over me. It's, um, it's, it's like, it's like miraculous how it happens, but I'm literally lying in bed like this. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you would do it for us. <laughs> like that, literally holding it. And I'm walking through a mental gratitude list while I'm doing okay. it. And it just kickstarts my day. I beat back the anxiety right away. I fight it. I, it's like, I'm walking into the world with the absolute arch enemy of anxiety, positivity. And, uh, and so I do that. And I hold it for somewhere between, you know, 15 seconds. Sometimes I'll hold it longer. Like if I'm struggling, I'm like, I'll just fucking hold this thing until I feel the, the feeling I'm looking for. And uh, and then I get out of bed with intention. So I snap out of bed. I put my feet on the ground and I stand straight up tensionally. And um, I make my way downstairs because <laughs> we have an awesome master bathroom in our bedroom that I'm not allowed to use anymore because <laughs> I make too much noise in there. So we, I use the guest bathroom downstairs and uh, I walk downstairs to the bathroom and uh, I brush my teeth. I floss my, I floss my teeth with a water pick, love my water pick. Um, and I wash my face. I have a little skincare thing that I do first thing in the morning that I started doing about a year ago that I just love. I take my time with it. I wash my face. I put on a serum. I put on moisturizer, put on eye cream. Love I'm, like, it. I'm, I'm in it. I'm in the skincare thing. Amazing. I, it just, it makes me feel so good. And, and ultimately as I get older, like I want to preserve my skin, you know, I, I, our face is uh, the part of our body that we are, that we expose most to the elements. And so it typically is the first part of our body to start weathering. 
right? And and I never thought about it that way. Um, no, but that's then a great I thought, point. Yeah, my wife was basically like about a year ago. She was like, "Have you ever like put moisturizer on your face?" And I was like, "I know." I wanted to jump in there and be like, "Any guys listening to this should really play that part back because it is important." And, yeah, and a lot important. of men and if, stereotypically. And, and by the way, it. also, like, it just feels so good. It makes yeah. me feel good. Like the smell, the 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 serum that I use. I I I, I use this uh, brand called Caldera Labs, and they just mm-hmm. it's like a three or four step thing, and it's just so good. It just smells good, and I love it. Anyway, so I do my skincare, and um, you know, I take a piss when I if I'm competing for something, I will check in. Uh, on the scale. If I'm not competing for something, I don't step on the scale. I don't need to. Um, and, uh, and then I, and then I, uh, I hop right down onto the floor. I've got a prayer practice that I've been saying for, for years. Uh, you know, I asked the universe for help. I, I like, you know, I, I still struggle with asking for help at times. Um, I've gotten way better because of this prayer practice, but, uh, I'm not a religious dude. I just am a guy who knows I need a lot of fucking help. And, um, and if I can start my day, uh, asking the, you know, the energy for help, well, then I've set my, I've set my right foot forward in the health department. And so I ask for help. I ask for guidance. Um, I, I pray for a lot of family members and, and friends and also people that I struggle with putting their names in like a, in a positive serene environment like that really does cool. help me potentially unravel some resentment that I might have, you okay. know, it's been, it's been a, a, a helpful tool there. I like that. Uh, and then I go right into push-ups. So I'll do 50 push-ups in the morning, get the blood flowing, get the chest pump, uh, feel good about that. And then I go right into a little stretch practice that I do. I do a down dog into an up dog. I do that about five times, give myself a little time to like really stretch my lats, my chest and lower back. And then I do um, a cat cow. I do five rounds of, of cat cow. Uh, and then I sit in child's pose for about 30 seconds. And then I get up and I walk into the guest bedroom where I have my red light therapy panel. And I sit in front of that bad boy. And uh, I will either meditate there or I'll listen to some sort of podcast, audiobook. Um, but it's, it's a time for me to sit for 10 minutes and I rotate every other day on my front, on my back. And uh, I sit for 10 minutes in front of the red light. And then I grab when I'm done with that, I grab my robe and I grab my water. I drink uh, 22. I I walk into the kitchen. I I open up the fridge. I make my water the night before. And I have a 22 ounce jug of water with juice from half a lemon, some pink Himalayan salt, shake that up. And I drink that relatively quickly. And then I fill it up again and I walk over to the infrared sauna. Um, where I, uh, it's already hot for me and I sit in the sauna for 40 minutes and in the sauna is when I am meditating. If I didn't meditate with red light, um, and I'm reading. And so if I didn't meditate in front of, in, in the red light, I will meditate for 15 minutes and then I'll read for the rest of the time. But that's when I get that, like, like the, this is like the beauty of this for me is like, I'm just slowly making my way through sure. these things, you know, like, no rush, no pressure. I'm just like, boom, I know what I got to do to make me feel good. Boom. I sit in the red light. I mean, I sit in the sauna, I read, I meditate. Um, and then I hang over my legs, uh, for about three minutes to just stretch out my hands, my posterior chain. Um, and I hang over my legs for three minutes. I started doing that about six months ago and it really, really has helped my lower back stuff. Okay. I just ragged all it there. What and encouraged then, you to like add that in, right? As you've kind of developed this routine for you, like when do you experiment with throwing something else into it or even taking things out and kind of like tweaking it? Yeah, I, I, I will, somebody will suggest something okay. and I'll try it. And if, cool. it, and if I like it, you know, I, 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 I stick it in. Cool. Um, and there are sometimes, you know, things that I will move around and, but, but, you know, this is this is what it's been. The one thing that I've actually done differently over the last few weeks, because I'm also working with a coach, um, really a life coach right now, who I hired a couple, about a month ago. And um, 
my journaling was feeling rushed. I, I, I'm so passionate about journaling. And so like, I, I tend to journal when I'm, well, let me get through the whole thing. So, so I, I do the thing, I hang over my legs and then I walk right across the garage and I jump into my cold plunge and I sit in the cold plunge for four to five minutes. Um, and that's where I get some breath work in. So I have a, a breath work practice that I do in the cold front, cold plunge. And uh, right after that, I walk over to the mirror and I have a conversation with myself. And that has been very helpful for me. I don't lie to myself. I don't tell myself that I'm the best thing that's ever walked the planet. I don't, you know, I, I the conversation I have with myself is you've got support, dude. You've got people around you that are going to support you. You've done a really good job so far. Like today's been awesome. And you've done a really good job so far in your life. And you failed, but you've you've done lots of great things. And you've got pe a lot of people that you love and a lot of people that love you back. And you should just know that you're, you're okay, kid. You're all right. You know, like that's the conversation I have. Literally, it's like, it's like a three minute long conversation that sounds just like that, where I'm looking at my self in the eyes and i'm not lying to myself telling myself i'm going to be a billionaire i'm saying you're you're a good person you're a good person you got to know that you got to remember that and then uh after i do that it's about 6 15 6 20 ish um i walk into the kitchen i mean i walk back into the house and and my wife and kids are up and that's when i close close the mike Chernow show and spend the next hour, hour and a half with my wife and children, totally focused, totally present with them. Um, and uh, t I take my kids to school every other day. This is also when I'm making my coffee. I am make I, I, I have like a I got a lot of beverages in the morning. I do coffee. I always have I three do. next to me at all times. So no judgment. You're in good company. <laughs> yeah, I got coffee. I got more water. I've got my ketone IQ. I've got this little detox crystal thing that I that oh, cool. I drink. Um, and uh, and I'm I'm just chilling with the kids at the fam. And uh, typically, I train. I either train at seven a.m. or I will train at ten. I've been pushing my training till ten a lot because I really. You know, I was training a little earlier, a few days a week, but then my, my wife brought to my attention and I also agree. She was like, you know, your kids are five and seven. Sometimes you leave the house right after you're done with your morning routine. Um, and that's cool because you're home five days a week for the kids, but like, you're never going to get these mornings back. So do you want to be here with them for breakfast and sure. go to the gym at 10? And I was like, yeah. So now I train pretty much at 10 every day. Um, and I, uh, I'll drop the kids off at school, come back. I will eat my meal one from Creatures of Habit, and that's my first meal of the day. Um, and then I'll get some work done at home, and then I'll head to the gym at 9.30, train, get to my office at 11.15, and work until 6. And that's my day, pretty much every day. Um, the one thing that I that I have slipped in there um, because I was journaling when I got to my office, uh, okay. and I felt like at that point I started feeling anxious. Like You'd I already shifted eat. into... My Work. job mode. Yeah. So before I go to the sauna now, I stop at the kitchen counter and I journal for 10 to 15 now, minutes. Now I know you said you've only been doing that for a couple of weeks, but I'd love to know what kind of shift have you seen in either what you're journaling on or how you feel? Because again, let's tie all of those steps back to what you said. So much of this was created around you being able to assess what makes you feel like you are going to be your best self, right? That's what this boils down to. So I'm asking you to, you know, reflect on that since you've made that adjustment. Do you, has it been, I know it's only been a couple weeks. Massive. And you have been talking about consistency, but Massive. what does that actually look like for you? Massive for me. That's awesome. Journaling, journaling. You know, I've created a journal. So there's a Creatures of Habit journal called the Habit cool. Stacker. And it's been, I spent a year working on it. It is really the greatest hits from all the journals that I've used over the years. Nice. I and like that it, description. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like, um, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that just wants to sit with a notebook and just write, you know, like I, I do, there's a part, there's a section of that. So like the, so like, this is kind of like what the journal looks like, right? Like there's this free flow writing spot. You could do that if you wanted to. 
Yeah, there's there's a daily planner here cool. where you just like plan out your day. There's a, a quote. There's a couple of questions about your night last night, um, your morning habits, your top three, your ongoing to do list. Um, and then this section here is is probably my favorite. Getting back to that reflection thing, you know, we walk through life. And a lot of the time we forget to stop and smell the roses, right? So something great can happen throughout the day. And you like, for a moment, you're like, oh, awesome. And then you just move on to the next thing. And so I prompted a few questions in the journal to actually make you stop and think for a minute and be like, it says, what was one great thing that happened yesterday? And so what it makes me do or forces me to do is like, be like, oh, wait, let me walk through my day. Like, let me think about one great thing that happened yesterday. And I'll be like, I did this in the morning and then I went here and then what, wait a second, that was fucking awesome. And I didn't even stop and think about it. Like, that was so awesome. I'm going to write that thing down. That that made me feel really good. That was like a great thing that happened. And then it also asks one great, one thing that did not happen so well yesterday. And that gives me an opportunity to grow, right? There's like appreciate the awesome shit and then opportunity to, 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 to look back, reflect, appreciate and grow. And, uh, and so I asked that question and then how, how can I be of service today? Which I also love to think about one person or one thing that I can do completely outside of any give and take, um, just all give, uh, how can I intentionally create an opportunity to be of service today? Um, and, uh, and then it asked me about one person I want to reconnect with. And I love this one because oh, what I do that's is a great one. I sit in my, I, I sit in my car in the morning, I open up my phone, I go to my contacts and I just go like this. And whatever my finger stops on Benny DeMirko, I'm going to text that dude and be like, Benny, it's sure now. It's been a minute. Just want to send some love brother. That's it. And most of the time that text gets responded to with a, Hey man, how's it going? I've been yeah. thinking about you too. You know, and it's just like another opportunity awesome. to get a little pop of positivity, right? That positive and interaction. One person. Yeah. And that's, that's the journal. So that, so, so the, the, I think also like the beauty of the journal too, is that it's just like, I, I write out my day, I plan my day um, and in the journal. So I'm not always having to open up my phone and get into the calendar mm-hmm. and then get caught in on Instagram and a fucking social media text message, email before I like went to look at my calendar and now I'm like DMing, yeah. you know, someone. Cause else. there's always something to answer. So I think that's oh. important, right? Like that's how you've created the, the structure and the construct to help with your commitment to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know that that was an intense, um, that was awesome morning routine that I, I think that's great. And I think, you know, I appreciate first and foremost that you prefaced it with the fact that it's taken you time to get here. And I can also tell, and I know that anyone listening to this can also recognize that based on everything you've said at this point, it's, you mentioned the flow of it and that it works for you, but it's also to me, yeah, you could argue that it's intense, but I think there's something about in the way you present it one, acknowledging that it took a while to get there, but two, the flow piece, like I hear like it's adaptable, it's malleable. Like there could certainly be a morning where something happens and I would assume, and I want your take on this, like let's play that worst case scenario. And I don't really know what it could be, but that you, because you've consistently shown up for yourself like that to that degree for a very long time, you know that you can handle whatever comes your way, right? Basically. The one other thing that I want to, that I, that I want to say is, is that's my morning. Like most of the time, if I'm at home, most of the time, that's what I'm doing. However, if I have a date night with my wife and we don't get home on a Saturday night until 11 o'clock, I sleep until six or seven. Or until the kids get up, you know, typically 637. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I'm, I'm totally down to give myself that shit. You know, if I'm traveling, like I've got a list of non-negotiables that I have to do every morning. Mm-hmm. I have to pray. I do my push-ups. I do my stretching. I do my hydration. And that's pretty much like what I know I need to do okay. to feel like I've gotten some shit done. But I've you modify it to, to your environment. You make it yeah. work. 
for what's going to so work. So there's a non-negotiable you. list. Yeah, sure. And then there's like, you're at home, you've got all the toys, you've got all the shit, mm -hmm. you know, it makes you feel great list, which is most of the time. I wanted to ask you, since you brought it back up again, for the push-ups, is there any significance to the number 50? Like, did you start somewhere else or like, did you tweak it to figure out if that was a good number for you? 50 is basically the, like what I've been doing for a long time. Okay. Um, and that's for me, I'm like, I want to be able to do 50 push-ups forever. Cool. So if I can just hit 50 every single morning, you know, um, and I also did read a long time ago ish that if you can do for men, if you can do more than 40 pushups in a row, your chances of, of, uh, heart issues drop by like 50%. So, you know, I've got heart disease in my family. When I read that, I was like, Oh man, I'm already doing this. I'm going to keep this Let's up. Keep I'm going to get 50. Yeah. And so that's really kind of it. And 50 is fucking hard, you know? 50. I'm sure. That's kind of why I was wondering. I was like, I, and and I know that you have intention behind all this. So in my mind, as you were listing that out, I was like, there's got to be something tied to that number. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about meal one, because we have to talk about the food component of all of this. And first I want to say, just give us the, the pitch on the product itself, because I want to compliment the fact that it is one of the only... And I'm not going to call it a breakfast item because I, I personally, I like the fact that you call it meal one. I, even when I have my clients track their food, we get rid of breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, like that construct goes out the door and I can share why, but I want you to tell me about that piece. But I'm very, very impressed with the amount of protein that it has. Like that's my nutrition coaching hat going on being like, if all of my clients could get that much protein first thing in the morning, so many things would be resolved for them. And they just don't always see that. Yeah. So protein is for me, protein is, it's just like the, the secret ingredient. I say um, protein is king. That's my phrase for people. Yeah. Especially I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, protein is like out of all the macronutrients, it's the one that is ultimately going to help you live longest and grow physically, you know? Um, and that doesn't mean like get big and bulky. That means that like, everything is going to grow in the right way. And the more, the more muscle you develop as a human being, the less fat you have. It's just science. You know what I'm saying? It's yep. like you build muscle and you will ultimately burn fat because it costs a lot of energy to build muscle and protein synthesis burns calories. It just does, right? So you eat a lot of protein or you eat a gram of protein per pound of lean body weight or lean body mass. Um, or if you're, you know, already on the, the lower body fat in the lower body fat arena, you eat a pound of, you eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, and if you're really trying to be like a, an animal, you eat, you know, one and a one to 1.25 grams per pound of body weight. But protein is king. And, and the story behind Creatures of Habit is basically what we've been talking about here. My life, you know, so before before I before I launched Creatures of Habit, I, I founded a company in, in in New York City called The Meatball Shop. It was a restaurant. Um, it is a restaurant, I should say. I've been to one it. That I launched in 2010 with a business partner. We opened up six restaurants together. I sold some equity at Meatball Shop. And then I founded another restaurant concept called Seymour's, also in New York City. I opened up six of those. Uh, from 2015 to 2019, I sold some equity to my partners there to go create another brand. And the brand is now Creatures of Habit. Um, I was developing Creatures of Habit and then the pandemic hit. It was originally going to be a restaurant and we were, I was going to use the restaurant as an incubator for a line of consumer packaged goods. Oh, cool. Uh, I did not know that part of the story. That's so interesting. Yeah. And then the pandemic hit. And so yeah. I had to really pivot Shift and rethink. Sure. However, wellness is my life. Wellness is my life. I've been in the restaurant business since I'm a kid. Um, it wasn't a family business. It was just like the first place that would hire me when I was 12. Um, and I fell in love with the, the industry. Um, but really the cornerstone of my happiness has been fitness, wellness, and mindset, fitness, nutrition, mindset. That's really been what I've, so I knew after opening up 14 restaurants, you know, I knew that I needed to open up a wellness business. 
And originally it was going to be a wellness restaurant, uh, but, but, you know, things happen. So, so Creatures of Habit was really developed because habits almost killed me. And I was able to figure out a way to make habits give me the greatest life I could imagine. You know, I really feel that way. I feel like I'm living, I'm not a billionaire, you know, I'm not, I'm not like driving Lambos, um, but I'm stoked to, I'm stoked about life and it's all because of my habits. And when I made the transition from addicted to sober, those two guys that I had mentioned earlier gave me a life plan, really. They taught me, they, they gave me a fitness regimen, uh, a nutrition regimen, and, and they taught me what I, you know, what I needed to do because they were also sober, um, in order to sustain the sobriety thing. And those two pieces, those two chunks, fitness and nutrition played a humongous role and still do play a huge role in my ability to stay sober. But, uh, they told me what to eat. And the first thing they told me to eat every single day was oatmeal. <laughs> and oh, I was so like 23 years old. Okay. I had no idea. I was just like, I didn't know shit from Sherlock when it came to nutrition. And I just said, um, you tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. And so I've been eating oatmeal as my first meal of the day to this very day, 18 and a half years later. And when I was thinking, and, but over the years I had added a bunch of stuff to it. And then of mm -hmm. course I had my supplements on the side. Um, every morning I had my D3, my omegas, my probiotic and my digestive enzymes every morning. That was like my essentials. Those are the four supplements that I just knew that I took for years. And, uh, when the pandemic hit and I knew I needed to pivot, I said, man, what the hell am I going to do? Like I, I had this whole business. I had all the investors lined up and everything. And I was going to wait to open the restaurant to start developing products. But I was on a run upstate in New York and it all came to me on that run. The, I said, you know, I've been eating this oatmeal concoction every single day. It takes me 20 minutes to make. It's got all these ingredients. I've been making it every single day for years. It's the, it's, and like, and I really care about my nutrition. Like I really care about what I put into my body. Like how cool would it be if I was able to package all this, including the supplements? Like if I was able to put my gluten free, glyphosate free oats, 30 grams of protein, chia seeds, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, pink Himalayan salt, probiotic, digestive enzymes, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin D3 into a pouch that was easy to make. Holy shit. That's like a great idea. That's, Pretty powerful, that's a, right? Not only is that a good idea, is that, that not, not only is that something that I would love to, 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 to have myself instead of having to have all this shit in my house and mm -hmm. make it every single morning, but like I could tell my story because it's so authentic of how this thing happened. Sure. And I got home from that run. I told my wife what I was going to do out of nowhere. She thought I was, I had lost my mind on the run. <laughs> and I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I want to tell my story. I want to help as many people as I can. This was a symbol of change and hope for me and got me on the path of better eating and better and, 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 and putting positivity into my body um, on a daily consistent basis. If I can make this convenient and easy and super healthy for people in place of, you know, Quaker instant oats serve a bowl of fucking cereal mm -hmm. or, you know, something else that people are eating where they're getting zero protein or very little protein um, and um, and lots of sugar. Like, how can I let me let me let me figure something out here. So I put, you know, I took a big risk and I put a couple hundred thousand dollars of my money into a bank account and I spent a year building this brand. And, um, I did it. I just, I put my mind to it. I, I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to create a brand called creatures of habit. I'm going to tell my story of, of overcoming adversity and challenge and, and self destruction and walking this life of wellness. And this was one of the first things that helped me. Um, this was one of my first footholds and I've been, and I've stuck to it for years and years and years. And, um, and so I, I created the brand. I built a really cool brand around it. I, I, I built a, a, a small line of apparel around it. I, um, I pitched it to Gary Vaynerchuk and um, he fucking loved it. He wrote the first check and we went out and raised some money. I launched it in August of 21. And so we're a little over, we're about a year and a half old. 
And uh, it's exactly what I want it to be. It's gluten and glyphosate free oats. It's 30 grams of super high quality plant-based protein. It's got chia seeds, flax seeds, and pumpkin seeds. It's nice. got pink Himalayan salt for electrolytes. It's got uh, 290 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids. It's got uh, 2000 IU of vitamin D3. It's got an awesome probiotic and digestive enzymes. And you make it overnight. Um, you can also make it hot, but it's best made overnight uh, in the fridge. It's super duper easy and it's delicious. And it's a full satiating meal. It's not breakfast. It's a meal. It's where, wherever you want to put it. I like to put it in the beginning of the day because most people correlate oatmeal with the beginning of the day. Um, but I call it meal one because there's lots of like intermittent fasters and people that are like, oh, you know, breakfast is not, I don't eat breakfast. And I'm like, okay. all right, well, you know, just say, go call it, call yeah, it what you want. Call you know, it whatever it's, it's you like want. A, exactly. Yeah. It's so we call it, it's called meal one. And, um, and we're, we're, we're developing a really awesome community of people that are, you know, already living the fitness wellness lifestyle that just want a more convenient meal mm -hmm. to have on the, on the fly or on the go. Um, and then we're also, you know, the community is also filled with people that are just really fired up to start their journey. You know, I loved what you said in a recent interview that you did with Gary and you said what you realized is it's really hard to sell habits if you think about it. Like, and I, that I listened to that. I was like 110% because that's what I do every single day when I get on a sales call to get a potential new client, right? Like that's ultimately, if I boil it down, if you look at any sort of fitness nutrition coach, they're all, we're all selling that same exact thing, but a lot of people don't find that stuff sexy, right? And then there's gimmicks and there's all these other things that there's a lot of noise that people are competing with. So what I also appreciate in what you described around your routine around your supplements and then marrying that with something that you were already doing, right? And, and putting these two things together, that's like a classic, I'm sure you've read Atomic Habits. And that's mm -hmm. like the pillar, one of James Clear's biggest pillars is make it easy. That is like the definition of making it easy, right? Because we just took something that we could sit here and argue is more complicated, but it's also less attractive, which is another one of his big ones and put it together into one thing. And it's like, boom, there you go. So I, I identify. You know, the, so the, the, the other thing that I'll say is like, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned it in the very beginning of the podcast where you said, you know, like where a lot of people are falling off their New Year's resolutions mm -hmm. because everybody wants to change it all right now. And they want the six pack. Now they want the, you know, the, the, the defined arms now. They want the, you know, the quads now. Um, and by the way, the shit just doesn't work that way. Period. It just doesn't. And you got to face the noise there. Like it's going to take time. And guess what? That's okay. That's okay. The thing that I think is, is, is really crucial is the most successful, you know, you asked me, you know, what's one thing in the morning, you know, that you can share with the audience to help them potentially get on this path. And I said, and go to bed at nine o'clock at night. The second thing I'll say is start with one meal. Like if you can't commit to changing it all today, which is really hard, like quitting smoking, quitting drinking, not going to the gym five days a week, eating broccoli and fucking peanuts. Like it just, it was one of those, if not all of those things are just going to implode after 10 days. Right. So I like to just really just understand that this is not going to be an overnight process. It's going to be a lifelong thing. Like I, I don't, I don't have a diet that I stick to. This is my life. This is my life. You know, I, the word lifestyle, like lifestyle is like kind of, you know, you think of lifestyle. It's like the woo woo, you know, yeah. a little, yeah. Woo woo. The truth is, is that like, it's my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. This is how I eat. This is how I train. This is what I do. And I love every second of it. And starting with one meal, committing to one meal is so much easier and is going to make you feel so much better than trying to do your whole entire nutritional journey every single day and failing right? Like if you can commit to the one, like that's, that's what I, that's, that's another reason why I call it meal one is because like, just commit to one. And I promise you, before you know it, consistency with that 
is going to snowball into meal two and meal three. And then before you know it, you're going to, you're going to feel bad, not eating the healthy stuff, you know? It's so true. So, so true. And I appreciate you bringing it back to that specifically, because again, we go back to your morning routine and somebody could take all that in and be like, oh my gosh, well, how could I get to that point? And it's like, remember, we said this was a marathon, but it starts with the one thing. And so coming from somebody like yourself, I just want to acknowledge you for really underscoring that because that to me, at least when I'm sitting here and hearing this, and again, I have that coach lens and I really align with you in that, in the way I talk with my clients. So this really, really resonates and the way I lead my own life too, especially when I find myself not putting myself at the top of that totem pole. I always, I have that conversation with my coach. He's like, what, just tell me something you could do in the next 20 minutes. Just tell me something you could do tomorrow. Like really let's boil it down here because I think sometimes as professionals in this industry as well, we know so much that we can overcomplicate things too. The other thing that I'll say though, also, cause I don't want to downplay this idea that there are people that can totally change it all. Yeah. Right. Like there are people that For are going to sure. be like, okay, today is the day where I am going to bring my carbs down by 50%, throw my protein up by 30% and bring my fat to a, to a healthy place. And like, understand what that means. And then you're given and a execute. meal plan and you fucking mm -hmm. stick to it. Right. Like there are people that can do that. And I, and I know, and you know, like more power to you. That's Hell amazing. Yeah. You should definitely do that. You know what I'm saying? But there <laughs> are a lot of people who want that so bad, mm -hmm. but really can't get out of their own way because there's fear involved. There's anxiety involved. There's years and years of, of, of bad habit that have to be chopped away slowly. You know, you can't just, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. Like the fact that I was able to stop drinking 18 and a half years ago, like, and that was that, that is why it's so like the success rate of sob sobriety long-term is so low because it's very, very hard. Of course. To just stop doing something, you know, like the people that are like, like yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no more sugar. I'm like, okay, good luck. Right. I'm, like, I'm like, 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 I'm good for you. Like, I amazing. want that for you, but yeah. it's not me. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like, it's, it's very, 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 yes. very hard. Mm -hmm. Very hard. You know, people that go on keto long term, I'm like, congratulations. Yeah. Like and that, if it works like, for you, right? Like, good for you. But then so, in that, we should also acknowledge too, like, there are so many different ways to do this. That's a good thing. Because you can find what works for you, but it yep. all goes back to committing to it long enough to assess that it is actually working versus throwing it out if it's only been 10 days. I just, two. I like, I like making attainable decisions that are going to make you feel like you've won consistently, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my mother, I've been trying to convince her to, you know, get in shape and do the things forever. I've gone to her house. I've set her alarm. I've bought her running shoes and I've put out her running shoes and her, her, her leggings and her whole outfit to just get into in the morning to go take a walk. She, she doesn't, she won't do it, you know? And, and, and so there are a lot of people and I, and I, I like all the stuff we're talking about is like, I'm very sensitive to people that, are really struggling with this yeah. stuff. But but the message that I have for you today, if you're one of these people, is just, you can do it. You can do it. I promise you can do it. Without a question of a doubt, unequivocally. You might not think you can do it. You might say you want to do it, but inside don't want to do it. But I promise you, you can actually do it. All you got to do is commit on a daily basis. It's not about tomorrow or the next day or what happened fucking yesterday. Cause yesterday's history tomorrow's not, no one's been able to change the past and certainly no one's ever lived in the future. Like if you can just <laughs> fucking do it today, you got it. You can do it. Just, just know that it's important. 
Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I do want to be respectful of your time too, because we have gone over a little bit, but I could probably talk to you on this subject forever because when I, when I meet somebody that your brain is just wired that way, but you're also so passionate to want to share it. It's like, let's tell as many people as possible. And when you start to see, I know for me, and I'm sure you feel this way too, in the people that you've been able to work with since you've started this company, the people that reach out to you and are like, hey, you have helped me change my life through meal one or through your journal. There's just something about that that is so gratifying and so satisfying to be able to lay your head down at night and recognize like, at least for me, I can't speak for you obviously, but I do want to know how you feel about this. Like there, when I have those like breakthrough moments with some of my clients and we're on zoom or on the phone, I'm talking to them in person or even just teaching a group fitness class and somebody takes two minutes to come up to me or send me that message on Instagram. That's like this thing that you said left such an impact on me. Sometimes I don't even realize what I said to them until it comes up later because I really do think this way. And like, I really am wired this way. And I, th to be able to see like that look on their face when they achieve something, there's just nothing that for me, like can really replace that feeling and, and fuels me every single day. Im impossible to replace that feeling. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's so, there's a lot of reasons why I, share my experience on my platform. I would argue to say that the absolute number one reason is to potentially have it resonate with one person. You know, like it's really weird, right? Like I use this analogy. I remember when I was trying to learn how to jump rope in Muay Thai, when I first started training, and I, it was so frustrating. I could not fucking do it. I, I just couldn't figure out the rhythm. I couldn't figure out the flow. Like it was just, it was really hard and I wanted to give up on it. And I had some, you know, those two guys that were just like, you just got to come in and do it. It's just, I know it sucks. You just, you know, you got, it's part of the, it's part of the, it's part of the routine. You got to yeah. do it. And then one day it just clicked. I don't know what it was, but I just started jump roping perfectly. Like it just, I just was, was in a flow and I came in the next day and it was just, boom, the flow was there and I just got the flow. And so that's happened to me in other areas of my life where I've heard something that someone has said and I was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it that way. Like I've been, I've been, I've been tiptoeing around this long, you know? And so if, if something I've said touches one person that way and they write me a note or a DM or something on that's, that's it. You know, I don't make money sharing my experience. Right. You know, I, I, I literally love helping people. I was in the hospitality business for so long. It was like, it was like the perfect place for me because I genuinely love making people happy and giving people, you know, I'm like, I'm like the king of the underdogs. You know, <laughs> I love it. I've always been the underdog and, um, and I love, I love the underdogs. It's like, it's, I, I love it. I, I love standing with the people that don't think they have it. And then before they know it, they have it. And it's just like, you know, it's like Rudy, the movie. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's like that confidence. There's just, there's something about that. You can't even bottle that up. Like it, it's just really cool to see it grow and transpire and, to take it all the way back to what you first said about who you are and why we should care about what you have to say, right? That's, to me, that's really full circle and saying, you know, you, you appreciate that underdog story. You're the king of the underdogs. But at the same time, you're really, you said it, you're just an average human being, right? 100%. That just commits. Yeah. You know, well, I'm, a, awesome. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a normal dude that loves facing fear, you know, like that's the, that's the one, that's the one separator. I think is that I've just gotten comfortable in fear. You know, you can walk through life, like living 
in fear, which is mm-hmm. such a shitty place because it controls you, you know, or you can, and maybe this will be the one thing that clicks for some people. You can understand that fear, like I said earlier, is everywhere and everyone has it. Everyone's scared. Everyone is scared. Doesn't matter how like big or broad or, or, or iconic or whatever that, you know, we think about some people, they're all scared. Everyone, Mike Tyson admits it, you know? (laughs) So you can understand that. And then when fear shows up, you can like put your arm around that fear just like this and look at it and be like, Hey, I see you. I know you're here. It's okay. I got this. We can walk together. We're going to, we're going to walk together, have the conversation, (laughs) you know, like, or you can let it like sit above you and push you down and make you feel small. You have a choice there, you know, like jump up off the fucking cliff. You know, you could get hurt or you can learn how to swim, you know, (laughs) Um, chances are you're going to learn how to swim exactly chances are you're going to learn how to swim exactly i doubt you're just going to sink it makes me think about you know as somebody who likes to create in lots of senses whether that's content businesses any kind of collaboration i spend a lot of time listening to podcasts like how i built this read guy raz's book and there was a recent interview i want to say it was with the founder of tart the makeup company um and she had a ton, Maureen Kelly is her name. And she's had, she had an v- extremely fearful moment in her life. She lost her first husband to 9-11. But when you listen to the story, and, and she was 29 and a widow, 29 years old. And she had no, no one had any idea that that was about to happen. And she walked through the experience of, you know, her husband had called her on the phone, told her everything was fine. And that was the last conversation they ever had. And obviously he was wrong. And she said, by the time I got to the end of the interview, they came back to this point multiple times. And she said, there was so much fear in that. But if that had not happened, because she knew that he would have wanted her to pursue what she did, that's why Tarte became a billion dollar business, which is just so cool Mm -hmm. to say. And I think there's so many founder stories that are like that. And for me, that's very inspiring too, because anything that I've been even so much more proud of creating has happened on the other side of a moment that I thought, oh my God, this is going to be the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. And I can truly now say it was the best because I get to sit here right now and be so happy with what I do. Mm -hmm. I said it earlier, you know, 90% of the fear that we have is fabricated. Yeah. Like the, uh, the what ifs, I'm not going to, no chance. I'm not, that's fear. That's fear. You know, and something that I I started doing a while back is um, once a week or once every two weeks when I'm journaling, you know, I have it in the back of the journal here. I've I've created this fear inventory section where if you're sitting and you're in fear, you're scared, work, family, whatever, you can turn to the back of the journal and you can just write the date, I'm in fear of, date it, shut it, close it. Three months down the road, you can open up that fear inventory if you've taken the time to actually write down those fears. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You could just be like, I am scared of, this is scaring the shit out of me. I am in fear of, blah, blah, blah. You look back at it and you'll realize that what you wrote down three months ago never happened. Yeah. Yeah. And it's awesome to be able to be like, wow, like I spent so much time in that fear. And the truth is, is like, it all worked out. And then you'll see that consistently and your threshold for fear will start to increase because you're like, well, it happened here and here. And that one actually happened. So that that sucked here and here, (laughs) it didn't happen. Like how much time am I spending being held back by fear, you know? Yeah. The energy that you're putting towards that, because again, it's that story that you create for yourself and 
I mean, I was already very intrigued to get the journal and encourage a lot of my clients to get it, but that might have sealed the deal for me because I think that's a, that's a really cool feature of it. So thank you for highlighting that part too. And before I let you go, I usually like to end my episodes with a little fun lightning round that will have very little to do with the deeper direction that we took the conversation. But um, as a New York City guy and as a restaurant guy, I feel like we need to make a theme around food. So I'm going to ask you some questions in that realm if you're cool with it. Let's go. All right. This might be a hard one, but I feel like you'll have an answer. If you can only eat at one New York City restaurant, it, it can be currently open or maybe it's closed. For the rest of your life, only one, where would you go? Oof, that's so tough. Oh, only one restaurant for the rest of my life. My gosh. It's, it's a toss up between two restaurants. You can give me two, that's fair. All right. One of them is probably going to be Little Frankie's. Great pick. In the East Village, because it's one of my favorite. I worked at Frank Restaurant for eight years. Oh, cool. And I would have said Frank, but Little Frankie's has a lot of the same stuff that Frank has, plus pizza. <laughs> so it would either be Little Frankie's or Sushi Asuda, because I love nice. sushi. And that's one of the best sushi restaurants in New York. I've been going there for a long time on special occasions, and I love sushi. Well, I endorse both of those. I've been to both, and they're awesome. And I like that you picked really different ends of the spectrum. So we'll allow the dual answer for that. Um, let's see. What you kind of gave me this answer in mentioning the sushi and the pizza, but you know, going back to what you mentioned earlier about your weekend and getting to Friday and knowing that at that point you've been locked in and you're like, I'm gonna eat what I want to eat and not feel any sort of guilt about it. What is that go-to food for you? Or do you like to oh, change boy. it up? Pulled pork. Oh, nice. I love, I make a kick-ass okay. pulled pork. I wasn't so going to expect you to say that. Cool. What's your secret journey, to your pulled uh, pork? Uh, yeah, I like, I like, I like the whole setup, you know, like I'll, I'll start it super early in the morning. Oh. I smoke a cigar. I like hang out. We invite my friends over at barbecue. And then, you know, there's like a big reveal, like nine hours later of this like amazing pulled pork big pulled pork sandwich. So good. Nice. Good answer. Again, lots of variety. We're covering all different <laughs> types of food here. This is good. This is important. Now let's keep it more New York city focused. What's your absolute favorite neighborhood in New York? Uh, my absolute favorite neighborhood in New York, you know, I spent a lot of time in the East village in my life a lot of years and years in the East Village. And so walking through the East Village, which I'm gonna do tonight, cause I'm driving to the city right after this podcast. Nice. And I, I've got to, I'm going to an event tonight and I'm gonna go and do the walk through the East Village. There's something really comforting for me in the East Village, cozy, comfortable. I spent a lot of my teen years there and all of my, a lot of my adult life there until I was like 27, we moved to Brooklyn. Um, but, I love the East Village. There's great re restaurants in the East Village. It's still a bit of a neighborhood. It's got some grit and some some grunge to it. Um, and I just have memories of, of, you know, my life there. You know, I've been arrested a bunch of times in the East Village. <laughs> um, I, um, but like for, I also love Nolita. I love Nolita too. Okay. Um, nice. Because I... I opened up Seymour's in Olita. I used to hang out in Olita a lot as well, but I, I lived in the East Village, so I have a little bit more of a connection to the East sure. Village. But I love Nolita. There's, there's, both of those neighborhoods have a great energy to them, a great restaurant component to them, um, like really cool people watching in both of those neighborhoods. So, you know, I spent a lot of my time, like when I was a young guy, when I was like 13, 14, 15, I would go down to, to Balthazar um, and sit on Spring Street between Broadway and, and uh, Center Street, or yeah, I think it's Center, right, the next avenue. And I would sit there in, on the benches in front of Balthazar, listening to music and watching people. It was like one of my favorite things to do. 
And so, you know, I love that area, you know, south is between Houston and Delancey or, or Kenmare or Broom Street, east of Broadway to uh, the Bowery. I'm going to have my mom listen to this episode. And I think she might agree with you on that last point. I have, I love that you mentioned Balthazar because I have memories from when I was like young and she was taking us into the city, like when we were in elementary school and she would force us to go to certain museums and things, but she went to FIT and so she loves New York and she had taken us there a few times. And I just like have vivid memories of going to some of those restaurants and walking around in that area. And I will totally agree with your statement of, and I, I lived in Charlotte for a while. So I was away from New York city for several years, but moved back during the pandemic to New Jersey. And then it was like, I had access to New York again so easily. And I took every chance I could to be able to go. And there's just something about it, like leaving it for a little while and then going back to it and, and having mm. grown up around it. Like it just, it makes you really think like years later, like, oh, what was I thinking as a kid at this point or in this space? And how, how do I feel about it now? So I totally relate to what you just said for sure. That's cool. Cool. That's awesome. Well, very last question and the most important because we want to stay connected with you and we want, if anybody out there wants to try meal one, wants to know more about creatures of habit, wants to get their hands on the journal, wants to just keep up with all the cool things that you're doing, tell us where we can find you. And of course, we'll link it down in the show notes. Um, well, if you want to check out creatures of habit, you can go to creatures and it's creatures with a K. So creatures uh, there's some awesome stuff on the site. There's a really cool, um, community component as well um for creatures so you know you could find meal one there you could find the journal there um and soon we're, we're we we ran out of all of our apparel but we're, we're dropping some new apparel really soon as nice. well um you can also follow along the creatures journey online on social at creatures of habit creatures with a k remember um and then uh you can follow along my journey on all social media channels at, at michael Chernow. really easy Perfect. Well, again, thank you so much for such a valuable and knowledgeable conversation. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity to connect with you. I say this often to a lot of my guests and just knowing your morning routine and we didn't necessarily point at this directly, but I think it definitely shines through in your comments around wanting to be present with your family and be your best self and be your best self in all the hats you wear as a dad, as a business owner, as a friend, whatever it is, right? One of the, for me, like presence is such a big thing. And it's something that I think we all have to work on in the age of our phones and, and being in a rush. And that's something I actually really appreciate about podcasting because it's the one time that I put my phone in complete do not disturb and I'm not thinking about anything else. And I get so much out of that. So I've gotten a ton out of this and I just want to thank you for that too. Thank you. This yeah, was awesome. Welcome. To everybody who tuned in today, we really appreciate all of you for being here. And as always, from wherever you're listening from, this has been another incredible podcast, another amazing episode for The Fix. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.